Good morning. I'm Alan Price, director of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library and Museum. And on behalf of all our library and foundation colleagues, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning and all of you who are watching today's program online. Uh, to open, I would like to humbly start with a land acknowledgement to recognize the tribes of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts peoples of the Wampanoag Tribal Confederation territories who both past and present and throughout many generations have stewarded the land where the Kennedy Library now sits today. And while a land acknowledgement is not enough, it is an important way to promote indigenous visibility and it serves as a reminder that we are all on stolen and settled indigenous lands. I invite all of us to contemplate how we might better support indigenous communities and learn how to honor and take care of the land that each of us inhabits. I would like to acknowledge the generous support of our underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsors Bank of America, the Lowell Institute, and AT&T, and our media sponsors, the Boston Globe. Today's program is also supported in part by the Government of Ireland Immigrant Support Program. Many thanks to the Consulate General of Ireland in Boston, Consul Leisha Moore, Vice Consul General Shane Caffrey, and Olivia Paolo for their work in support of this morning's program. We look forward to a robust question and answer uh, period this morning. You'll see full instructions on screen for submitting your questions via email or comment on our YouTube page during the program. When Q&A starts, we will invite those of you who are joining us in person today to proceed to the microphones in the aisles to ask your questions. President Kennedy greatly valued his Irish heritage, the Kennedy family's longstanding commitment to building a strong relationship between the United States and their ancestral homeland makes us especially grateful to have this opportunity to explore Ireland's foreign policy, the Irish-US relationship, and key global issues with our distinguished guests this morning. I would also like to add a special welcome to our visitors, a future generation of leaders from BC High, our neighbors here on Columbia Point, is always particularly exciting. <laughs> to know that future generations, still inspired by President Kennedy's leadership, increasingly aware of global issues around the world, will go forth and do many good, good things. We're counting on you. I'm now delighted to introduce today's speakers. I'm honored to welcome Simon Coveney, Ireland's Minister for Foreign Affairs and Defense to the Kennedy Library. Before his work in his current roles, he served previously as Tawniste, or Deputy Head of Government, as Minister for Housing, Planning, and Local Government, as Minister for Agriculture, Food, and the Marine. He is Deputy Leader of the Fine Gael Party. I am also delighted to welcome our moderator for this morning back to the library. Robert Morrow is Executive Director of the Irish Institute and Founding Director of the Global Leadership Institute at Boston College. Dr. Morrow, whose research focuses on ideology and conflict, has established a number of organizations that support Boston College's work in Europe and on transatlantic economic and policy issues. And now, to help us welcome our special guests, I'm delighted to introduce Shane Caffrey, Vice Consul General of Ireland to New England, to say a few words. Aguinusla, a carja, Thon Oz Erm, a Van Shaw, Egan Crinu Special to Shaw in you. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, friends, I'm delighted to be here at the JFK Presidential Library this morning and to be joined by Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister for Defence, Simon Coveney, for this discussion on the Irish-US relationship and key global issues. It is so great to be here at this beautiful building on the edge of the Atlantic Ocean and to be attending events in person once more. At the Consulate General of Ireland in Boston, we are fortunate to have a close relationship with a wonderful team here at the JFK Presidential Library and we are delighted to support their work via the Emigrant Support Programme. I want to pay tribute to the team here who work with us to foster and grow strong and enduring links between the consulate and the library, which underline our efforts to celebrate and strengthen the exceptional transatlantic links between Ireland and the United States. Links not just with the United States, but with Boston and New England. 
in this very special corner of America where one in five people are cl claim Irish heritage. So what a better leg legacy than that of JFK around which to celebrate this very special relationship today. So thank you for your time this morning. Thank you for joining us today and I hope you enjoy the discussion to follow. Gurumalka. Well, can I say, first of all, I'm uh, really both privileged and, uh, and very happy to be here this morning. Uh, what, a, what an incredible place to start the day, uh, a place of inspiration, uh, a place of pride for Irish Americans in particular, um, but a place that tells the story of, uh, of President John F. Kennedy um, through imagery, uh, through media, through his speeches, um, and the, the idealism, the drive, the energy that he brought to, to the United States for that all too short a period uh, in politics. Uh, and of course, his, his return to Ireland. Um, uh, he was the first sitting president to visit Ireland in 1963. Um, and those memories are still cherished in Ireland uh, all these years later. Um, so, uh, it's a real privilege to be here um, at a time of global uncertainty uh, when we are literally seeing the pages of history uh, change day by day uh, in the context of what's happening on the continent of Europe. Uh, I never thought I'd be sitting in front of an audience like this one as, a, as an Irish foreign minister and defense minister uh, talking about a large-scale war in the heart of Europe. Um, uh, the scale of which we haven't seen since the Second World War, uh, that has driven uh, more than five million uh, uh, Ukrainians to flee their own country into the European Union. Nearly 27,000 of those have come to Ireland so far, and we're planning for tens of thousands more. Um, uh, and uh, those of us who are privileged to offer political leadership are challenged now with the complexity of how we respond to raw aggression, uh, brutality um, uh, in the heart of Europe um, uh, uh, in a way that can protect Ukraine and its people, uh, in a way that avoids, avoids escalation of this conflict into something even bigger, uh, and in a way that, that shows um, our humanity. Uh, as, uh, as democracies working together uh, in response to, uh, to what we're seeing uh, day after day. Uh, so as somebody who, who visited Kyiv two weeks ago, uh, who stood on the edge of mass graves uh, in the suburbs of Kyiv, um, uh, this is a, a serious and sobering time. And it's a time uh, when the world needs leadership. Uh, and I, I have to say, um, the leadership that, um, that President Biden and the team around him are showing and the intelligence and calmness that they are responding to this challenge with, uh, I think is the kind of leadership that the world needs right now. Um, and, um, and we are a close partner, not only with the United States, but with all of the other countries too, in Europe and beyond, who are trying to find a way of bringing about an end to this madness, um, while at the same time protecting the integrity and the future ambitions of Ukraine and its people. That's not easy. Um, uh, and so I'm, uh, I'm privileged to talk about some of those issues with you now, as well as, of course, talk about some of the challenges that Ireland continues to face in terms of our own peace process. Uh, we have an election in Northern Ireland next week. Um, I, I don't say this lightly, but I think in the almost 25 years since the peace agreement was made in Northern Ireland, the institutions of that peace agreement, the Good Friday Agreement, are perhaps more uh, under threat now than they've been at any point in that 25 years. Um, and that is something that, um, that I and others need to address, again, with calmness and intelligence, uh, given the complexity of some of those issues. Um, so I look forward to your comments and questions. And once again, uh, this part of the United States, uh, uh, and of course, this place, uh, within Massachusetts uh, and Boston, uh, given its Irish heritage, uh, uh, is, uh, is a place that continues to be a source of inspiration and support for the transatlantic relationship, which I think is absolutely essential 
in the context of the leadership that's required uh, right now in response to, to Russian aggression. Um, so, um, and of course, uh, that connectivity is also uh, enormously valuable in terms of maintaining positive momentum in the context of the Irish peace process and the institutions that are needed to, to protect it and develop it. So uh, thank you, and I look forward to your, to your comments and questions. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, thank you very much to JFK Library for hosting this forum. It's exciting to be back here with you and, and the audience in person again uh, to talk about these really important issues. I mean, you've already laid out um, a very kind of challenging global um, environment with the war in Ukraine. Of course, we all know about COVID, the consequences of the economic struggles. Um, our own's been busy on the foreign affairs front. You are involved in many multilateral organizations. You are on the Security Council in the United Nations. You're key to the European Union. I think one place I want to start actually is something you said just before we came up here. You said that it's hard not to come through this building and not look at the world differently, meaning the, the JFK Library. Um, I mean, how important is it for you and, and for your peers um, to kind of take those moments to come to places like the JFK Library, to look at the world differently as you confront these challenges. I thought it was a very interesting thing you said when we were in the wings there. Yeah, I mean, I think the truth is that, uh, that politicians don't take the time, perhaps enough, to, uh, to think more deeply about the decisions they have to make because they're, they're, they are just confronted with the immediate nature of politics and the demands of how media communicates message today. Um, you know, we don't issue press releases anymore, we just put it up on social media platforms. Um, and, uh, and every time we do it, we speak to hundreds of thousands of people within seconds. Um, and so, uh, in some ways, um, politics now is more complex than it was in the 60s when, uh, when John F. Kennedy was, was trying to give global leadership. Um, because facts um, aren't always facts today. Um, the way in which media operates is, is in the basis of emotion and momentum and headline grabbing and competition for space. Uh, and sometimes um, common sense is the casualty there. Uh, and we allow small problems to spiral into much bigger ones. Uh, and that's why I think the um, this extraordinary challenge that the world now faces, uh, where uh, Russia has invaded its neighbor um, um, and, uh, and is intent on continuing to cause mayhem uh, across Ukraine, uh, requires a really thoughtful and united response from enough countries in the world to be able to, uh, to create a sufficient deterrent to Russia uh, uh, on the continuation of that war. So for me to be able to take the time this morning before this event to walk through the exhibition here, to listen to some of the Kennedy speeches, uh, to read some of the uh, inspiring quotes, uh, and to, uh, to sort of immerse myself in the idealism that was JFK at that time in history, which is before I was even born. Um, uh, is, uh, is, I think, a reminder of what politics can do you know, and what good politics can do uh, and what global leadership can be, whether it was standing in, in Berlin uh, talking about how that represented um, the, the clash between communism and democracy, uh, or indeed whether it was returning to Ireland, um, uh, talking about how a small country has created this extraordinary global influence largely through tragedy and forced migration, um, or indeed whether it was inspiring this country uh, in the context of social justice. Um, you know, politics can be an extraordinary force for good and a fantastic stabilizer in times of peril and risk, or it can be the opposite. Um, and that's why I think, um, I think buildings like this one and the stories that they tell as people come in, um, and what I said to you earlier was, w when you leave, you're looking at the world through a slightly different perspective than when you walked in the door. And that in itself is an extraordinarily valuable, not only legacy in terms of what the Kennedys and, uh, and John F. Kennedy in particular uh, brings to politics, but also a way of thinking.
um, and, uh, and a way of perhaps looking in the mirror and asking some more searching questions than otherwise might be the case because often politics today is so immediate and so driven by sound bites that actually that depth of analysis sometimes doesn't, uh, doesn't inform decision making in the way that it should. Um, we sit in a little corner of Boston here uh, with the JFK Library and the Edward Kennedy Institute next door um, that has deep connections with Ireland. Whether it was John F. Kennedy uh, visiting his ancestral homeland and declaring this is from whence I came, or Ted Kennedy's involvement in the peace process and his work with John Hume, there's always been that look from here uh, to support what's happening in Ireland. You just spoke about how politics can sometimes um, create good things and sometimes it can create problems as well. As you think about um, the Kennedy family legacy and Ireland and Northern Ireland, I mean, what are you seeing right now in, in terms of uh, the Northern Irish peace process? Um, the negotiations on the protocol continue. Um, where do those stand and, and how do they relate to um, the election on, on May 5? Yeah, um, uh, okay, there's a lot to unpack there. So, so um, first of all, um, Northern Ireland is a relatively small place, but an incredibly complex place politically, and many people in this, know, uh, this room will, will follow politics on the island of Ireland, north and south, very closely. Um, and it, it, it always amazes me every time I come to the United States, the depth of understanding and interest in Ireland and its future and its relationship with the United Kingdom is, um, is, still, is still so strong. Um, so next week, there's an election in Northern Ireland for the, for the Assembly, which effectively is the devolved government structure in Northern Ireland uh, under, the, under the peace agreement. Um, but I think putting a devolved government structure together and the other institutions that flow from that of the Good Friday Agreement will be very, very difficult after the 5th of May. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, the first one being that we're likely to see a potential shift in, um, in the, the size of parties as they relate to each other. So after this election, we may well see Sinn Féin being the largest party in Northern Ireland, which will be the first time that a nationalist party has been larger than the largest unionist party. Um, and that in itself, I think, is... Uh, is causing friction and tension and uncertainty and anxiety uh, for some in the unionist community, uh, which I think will make the compromises that are necessary to put an executive and a functioning devolved government in place in Northern Ireland more difficult. But that isn't the most difficult thing we have to deal with. Um, the most difficult thing is, is the continuing debate around the, the fallout from Brexit. And it's really important that we talk about the fallout from Brexit as opposed to essentially take the view, as some people would like you to believe, that Brexit is done now, so let's just forget about that and just talk now about the problem of the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. It's really important to understand the context here. Um, the decision of the United Kingdom as a whole to leave the European Union, to leave its single market, to leave its customs union, to effectively plough their own furrow, uh, to, to look at changing uh, and diverging their regulatory model from the European Union and moving in a different direction. While, of course, I respect that decision, uh, my job is to protect Ireland as an island, north and south, from the disruption of that. And we spent a number of years trying to address the challenge for the island of Ireland, north and south, of the disruption of Brexit. Because don't forget... The relationship between Northern Ireland and, uh, uh, and, and the Republic of Ireland um, after the Good Friday Agreement and because of our joint membership of the European Union meant that effectively there was an invisible border. There was no need for any trade border checks because we were sharing the same common market and there was no need for any security checks because we had a peace agreement. Um, and so what you had was you had convergence in terms of a regulatory model that made the border far less relevant. Of course, there's a political border, a constitutional border, but in terms of movement, you know, today you, you, you don't know when you cross the border, when you drive across. Uh, it's that invisible. 
The problem is that Brexit is about divergence. And divergence means borders, barriers, checks, uh, because you know, the rules of international trade require that. And so from day one, after the, the decision to proceed with Brexit was made, we were trying to figure out how do we deal with this issue to protect the peace process, protect relations on the island of Ireland, keep free movement of goods, of people, of services, interaction between communities and business people. That was a reinforcer to peace and normality on the island of Ireland, a really important part of the peace process. Um, how could we ensure that that was protected and would continue, uh, while at the same time respecting the decision uh, of uh, the United Kingdom as a whole, because Northern Ireland, don't forget, voted against Brexit. Uh, the majority of people didn't want Brexit, and still don't. Um, um, and so lots of solutions were put on the table, um, which we don't have time to go into now, but the one that was settled on in the end, after there was a change of Prime Minister, and Boris Johnson in particular insisted on a Northern Ireland-specific solution, rather than a UK-wide one. And that became known as the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and it was essentially designed to try to manage the disruption of Brexit and the divergence that would be caused to, uh, 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 in the context of the peace process and the absence of physical border infrastructure. And so the protocol effectively was that Northern Ireland would leave the EU along with the rest of the United Kingdom, would remain in the United Kingdom until a majority of people wanted to change that until and unless a majority of people would change that, which is the principle of consent under the Good Friday Agreement, but that it would stay within the EU single market for goods, which would prevent the need for any trade uh, border infrastructure between North and South, which would be deeply divisive uh, politically if anyone were to try to impose that. The price of that, of course, was that there, there was some checks required on goods coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland uh, because those goods were coming from Great Britain into the EU single market for goods. With no barriers, they could end up in Cyprus or Spain or France or Germany or wherever. Um, and so that's what was agreed. That was the model that would prevent border infrastructure on the island of Ireland, would create some technical checks on goods coming into to Northern Ireland from GB because, of course, they could find their way into the rest of the EU single market. That became an international treaty and international law. And that is now what the British government say they want to change and renegotiate. And while we, of course, are up for accommodating solutions to the legitimate concerns that, that, uh, that some people have in terms of trying to facilitate more seamless trade between on goods traveling from GB into, into, into Northern Ireland, what we are not up for is effectively opening up a renegotiation of the entire deal, which took years to put together. And those that are advocating for uh, doing away with the protocol at this stage are not actually putting up any alternative uh, that can do the job of the protocol, because this is not an easy issue to solve. Um, and of course, the reason why this is so important for Ireland, south as well as north, uh, is that if, if the protocol doesn't function, and if the integrity of the EU single market isn't protected, in other words, if we don't know what's coming into the EU single market through Northern Ireland, well then Ireland's place in the EU single market for goods gets called into question, which is the very basis of our economic model, because we export 85% of everything we produce in Ireland. Most of that goes to the rest of the, the EU single market in a completely tariff-free, barrier-free way. So this is a complex issue. The reason why I've given you that sort of long background on it is that you will hear some messages that are simplistic that say the protocol uh, is a problem and the protocol is undermining the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement. That, in my view, is a misrepresentation uh, of what's actually happening here. The protocol was a good attempt to try to manage the disruption of Brexit. The source of disruption is Brexit. Not, not the protocol. The protocol is about containing that and trying to manage it in a way that's technical and legally sound. Uh, the political challenge for us, unfortunately, is that some in the British government and some in the unionist community, and they're very genuine about their concerns, 
feel that the protocol, because it requires some checks uh, within the UK, between Great Britain and Northern Ireland, that that is an undermining of economic sovereignty of the United Kingdom and so on, and therefore those checks have to go. Um, but in truth, we've had those arguments for a number of years, and we, we found a compromise uh, on the basis of the protocol. The challenge now is, is to go further and find further compromise. Uh, and the way to do that is to apply the maximum flexibility possible uh, to how the protocol is implemented to minimize to the greatest extent possible the need for checks on goods coming from Great Britain into Northern Ireland and to differentiate between goods that are staying in Northern Ireland and we can show and prove that they are in terms of purchase and consumption and to apply an even less uh, checks burden uh, to those goods so that we can try to reassure a unionist community that we're not in any way trying to undermine Britishness uh, or uh, the United Kingdom in terms of their ability to trade within the United Kingdom. But at the same time, we've got to protect the integrity of the EU single market and ensure the absence of a physical border between North and South, which of course is the, is the, um, uh, the, uh, the purpose of the protocol in the first place. So I hope that wasn't too, um, too, too technical or too detailed, um, but I know this is a very informed audience. Um, but that is what we're trying to do. And unfortunately, what we're hearing from some voices in London at the moment is that the British government is going to uh, effectively pass domestic legislation to set aside or to override elements of international law, which is, let's be blunt about it, is a breach of international law, uh, in order to do away with elements of the protocol because politically they don't like it. Um, and that is causing tension uh, between the British government and the EU, because this is essentially a deal between the EU and the UK, not a deal between Dublin and London. But of course, I and the Irish government are, want to be and are very involved in trying to find acceptable compromises that everybody can live with. Um, and the reason why all of this is important in the context of the peace process is that the largest unionist party and the party likely to be the largest unionist party after these elections has said that they will not go back into devolved government until and unless the issues of the protocol are dealt with comprehensively. Um, and while those two things probably shouldn't be linked, they are. Um, and, and even if that weren't the case, uh, we would need to try to find a basis of compromise and agreement that can allow us all to move forward. Um, but in the absence of that, um, I mean, think about this for a second. The institutions of the Good Friday Agreement require structured north-south cooperation in Ireland that hasn't been functioning for well over a year now, requires devolved government in Northern Ireland, and that devolved government structure was collapsed a number of months ago before these elections got underway, and it requires east-west structured cooperation between the British and Irish governments, between L London and Dublin. That is happening, but has been under some strain. So all three key structured uh, institutions of the Good Friday Agreement are under significant pressure, and of course the the influence of the protocol uh, issues and the broader Brexit issues have been deeply polarizing, not only in terms of the politics of Northern Ireland, but also society and business there. Um, so we have a lot of work to do uh, to, uh, to try to settle some of those issues and to focus on building positive momentum in terms of relationships uh, in Northern Ireland in the months ahead. Um, in, in, you know, in the event that the institutions remain collapsed after the um, the election. I mean, how is Ireland going to um, help the people of Northern Ireland, um, you know, live and function in, in a society? The, you know, when the institutions in Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland executive aren't functioning, Northern Ireland doesn't function as well as it, it should. So, I mean, yeah. wh what are your hopes after the election to help? Well, them? well, I mean, what I'd say is that from my experience and from the experience of the last 25 years, Northern Ireland tends to function reasonably well when the British and Irish governments are working together in partnership. And I think the biggest change in recent years is that that partnership has been absent. And that's something, again, that I am slow to say publicly, but it's true. Um, and we need to, to rebuild that partnership approach between the two governments on how we deal with the challenges that the parties face in Northern Ireland for their own people and the people they represent. 
Because if the two governments aren't the anchor here, if they're not the foundation, that, that helps the, the parties to find compromise uh, and understanding, uh, then, um, then relationships become even more challenging. So I'm very conscious of that and the role that the Irish government needs to play, and I hope the British government is too. So if you take an example, for example, of you know, how we deal with the legacy of the past in Northern Ireland, um, which is about the most sensitive issue. And many people in this room will know all about that because their own families and, and their own relationships uh, would have been impacted by, uh, by, by killings and, and murders in the past in Northern Ireland. And we agreed a number of years ago between the two governments and all of the parties with the exception of one in Northern Ireland on how to do it together in terms of setting up new structures, allowing for a route to, to justice, uh, but also to truth recovery, and of course to try to put it in a context in terms of a, a, you know, an accurate depiction of history, recognizing that people have you know, very different perspectives uh, on, on history and what drives that in Northern Ireland. Uh, and unfortunately, we've seen the British government effectively say we are, that they're no longer committed to that approach, to dealing with the legacy of the past, um, and we are trying to, to figure out how we can get back to a partnership approach on something as sensitive as legacy. Um, and, uh, and so that, that's one example, but there are others too, of the need for the governments to work together on sensitive issues, to find compromises together where possible uh, in the context of the protocol that obviously involves the European Commission uh, in a central way as well. Um, but I believe we can do that. Uh, and I believe we can work with the leadership uh, and the parties as they emerge from this very polarizing election next week, uh, because the alternative to devolved government in Northern Ireland is not good for the people of Northern Ireland. It's not good for relationships, north-south or east-west, uh, and I think it will lead to an even more polarized society. And I think we all have an obligation to work against that. So, so the government's working together, I think, is a key catalyst for what's required over the summer uh, and of course mature and in some cases courageous leadership in Northern Ireland from, from party leaders and from leaders within parties because they're not always the same thing um, to try and find a way forward uh, is, uh, is also important but you know Northern Ireland has been through darker times than they're facing today much darker times uh, and they found a way of finding the light uh, and they'll do it this time too, but uh, the governments need to be um, proactive and positive in terms of helping that, uh, helping that happen. I mean, you've been talking a lot about partnership and, and uh, Dublin's important partnership with London. Um, Ireland, over the past decade, has taken a conscious uh, global leadership role. Uh, you've partnered um, with the United Nations and elements within the European Union and other multilateral institutions. You were the first um, member, the first foreign secretary on the Security Council um, to visit the Ukraine recently. Um, and, and you wrote quite movingly about that experience when you returned. You talked about the beauty of the Ukraine and how it contrasted with the horrors of the mass graves. I mean, what are some of the key things that Ireland, um, admittedly a small nation in, in Europe, um, not a military power in Europe, um, can do to you know, assist the European Union in its quest to support peace in the Ukraine? Yeah, um, good question. Um, we're a small country, but we try to insist on being heard. And uh, when Irish people came to the US, I, I think they, take, they, they took the same view. Um, they've done a and, good job. <laughs> and they've done a pretty good job. Um, a number of Irish Americans have gone all the way to the, to the top job here, uh, insisting on being heard. And that's a, I think that's a very Irish thing. Um, we don't have a sense of our own importance, per se, but we try to build relationships and things flow from there. Um, so look, we're doing, the, we're doing the obvious things. So, you know, Ireland has so far committed 33 million euros to support the Ukrainian military, which is something that's very unusual for Ireland. But let me just be very clear while Ireland is a neutral country, which is defined as we are not militarily aligned to any defense pact or alliance, but we are not neutral when it comes to a war like this. And we're not neutral on many conflicts around the world. 
uh, uh, and try to provide a, a perspective that is about peace, a humanitarian-based approach, uh, a multilateral uh, problem-solving approach, and so on. So, you know, we've, uh, we are funding, as is every other country in the European Union, uh, the Ukrainians to try and defend themselves. Uh, we have put uh, significant resources into um, humanitarian assistance. Uh, we were one of the countries that insisted on referring what we regard as likely war crimes in Ukraine to the International Criminal Court. Uh, I announced uh, 10 days ago 3 million euros of support for the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, Karim Khan, to make sure that he has the resources to put teams on the ground to document what's needed to be able to put cases together, even though it may seem remote now that those responsible for mass murder in places like Bucha and elsewhere in Ukraine will find themselves in front of a judge in a court. That is something that we want to pursue with the international community. Uh, we've been very vocal in the Council of Europe and we're about to take the chair of the Council of Europe for the next six months. We've been vocal in the Human Rights Council. Of course, we've been vocal in the Security Council, which unfortunately has failed in terms of trying to prevent conflict here uh, because of the way and the structure uh, that works in the Security Council. Russia has essentially vetoed um, uh, a resolution coming through the Security Council in, in response to what's happening. We, with other countries, very quickly then brought a resolution to the, to the General Assembly of the, uh, of the UN where there's no veto. And of course, the resolution that was passed on, on Ukraine and on Russian aggression there uh, was only opposed by four other countries out of 193, uh, along with Russia. The only countries that voted with Russia at that time were Syria, Belarus, Eritrea, and North Korea, which I think says a lot uh, about how isolated Russia is today in terms of what they're doing uh, and the uh, despite the, the efforts at disinformation, uh, I think the majority of the world know the truth about what's happening. And it is a role of, of Ireland to tell the truth, to try to combat disinformation. Uh, when, there are, when you are neutral in the context of non-alignment militarily, it sometimes gives you a little bit of extra credibility in terms of calling out wrongdoing and breaches in international law and right and wrong when it comes to conflict. And we've tried to use that credibility as much as we possibly can. Um, and that's why I, I wanted to travel to, to Kyiv, because I wanted to be able to speak at the Security Council as a minister that had seen it for myself, uh, as opposed to relying on social media images uh, or media coverage. And I think that does give extra edge and credibility to what you say. When, when somebody is saying that mass graves in Bucha is not happening, uh, is a propaganda ploy by the Ukrainians, for me to be able to say, I stood over that mass grave and I looked into it, and bodies had been taken out the day before, and I know what I saw, uh, I think adds to, um, to the impact of what we're trying to do as a small country with as strong a voice as we can muster. Um, so. Um, so we will do all the things that you would expect of, a, of a, an EU member state in response to, uh, uh, to Russian aggression uh, and, uh, and breaches in international law and the UN Charter. But of course, we're also trying to focus on, on how do we bring this to an end? Because ultimately, there needs to be a political solution, a diplomatic or series of diplomatic interventions that can create a basis for a ceasefire a basis for, for peace. Um, and it's really important that we don't lose sight of that uh, in our support of military campaigns um, or, uh, or accountability you know, in front of an international court uh, or you know, undermining disinformation campaigns. All of that's important. But actually, the real prize here is how do we stop the killing, for me? Um, and, uh, and how do we support Ukraine in that context uh, to ensure that their dreams for the future aren't undermined uh, or sold out uh, in an effort to achieve that? Um, and that is really complex because in many ways, the more successful Ukraine are militarily, the more aggressive the Russian response. 
the more successful Russia, Russia is militarily, uh, the, uh, the darker the prospects for Ukraine. Um, uh, and so, so there's no simplistic win here. Um, and that is why um, uh, we continue to support Ukraine in every way we can, politically, militarily, legally, um, and uh, on all of the platforms that we can, that we can generate um, uh, support. But we've also got, I think, work with them on, on trying to explore a base for agreement and compromise in a way that recognizes the political realities in the Kremlin too, uh, which is um, not easy, to put it mildly. Uh, and and I, I think you know, that kind of thinking is happening in the White House. It's happening in the institutions of the European Union. Um, and what's quite inspiring about the response to the war in Ukraine has been the united, nature, the, the united nature of the response. I mean, I've been in politics for 23 years. I have never seen the European Union as united. Um, I think probably President Putin made a judgment call to proceed with an invasion now because his, he perceived that the European Union was, was weak. Um, there was new German leadership. Um, there was a French presidential election coming up. Uh, Britain had just left the European Union and there was still some tension in, in the context of that process. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the, the view was that the transatlantic relationship wasn't um, uh, a strong one. Um, and I think in many ways, this has been a massive miscalculation by the Kremlin on all of those things, because um, Europe has come together uh, in, a, in a way that I haven't seen. You know, we, we essentially signed off on five sanctions packages, one after the other, in the space of less than three weeks. Normally, it would take six months to even consider agreement on any one of those packages. Uh, we've agreed to effectively remove any visa requirement for any Ukrainian uh, coming out of Ukraine t t to travel anywhere in the European Union. Uh, no limit on numbers, no quotas. Uh, if 10,000 10, Ukrainians come to Ireland in the next week, we will accommodate them. Find a way to do it, um, just as Poland has uh, in the last number of weeks. And let's not forget that the one thing the European Union could not agree on for the last 10 years politically was any agreement on anything to do with migration. And here now we have uh, a, a, an approach not only to accommodate five and a half million, but planning to accommodate 10 million and to essentially treat them as EU citizens in terms of healthcare, education, housing, supports, um, um, uh, financial supports and welfare and so on. So, um, so yeah, Europe is changing before our eyes. Countries like Germany have changed their foreign policy overnight. We're seeing Finland and Sweden uh, on a pathway to likely NATO membership by the end of the year. Uh, a country like Ireland, unlikely to look at NATO membership, I think, anytime soon, but certainly fundamentally reassessing our own approach towards security and defense, uh, likely to agree to increase our uh, resourcing of our defense infrastructure by up to 50% in the next few years. Uh, I'm bringing a, a, uh, a series of recommendations to government on that in June. Um, so what President Putin and the Kremlin have started here through aggression and an attempt to dominate their neighbor, to suck them back into the sphere of influence of Russia, because they hate the idea of Ukraine as a country moving in a different direction towards something brighter and better um, uh, in the context of EU membership, has actually lit a fire under the European Union to remind us actually what that project is really about which is peace, democracy. Uh, the collective is always more powerful than the individual. Um, and a value system that drives all of that, which I think uh, has extended across the Atlantic too, by the way. Uh, the time that Secretary Blinken has spent in Europe in the last few weeks and months you know, has been probably more than any of his predecessors have in many, many years. Um, so this is pulling uh, a large part of the Western world together on the basis of seeing this as a, as more than simply a war in Ukraine, but instead a, a conflict that is about values and ideology uh, and law.
and, uh, and, um, and the protection of uh, human beings who are being brutalized and slaughtered. Um, and what makes this different to many other wars in the past is that in some ways it's the first social media war we can actually see what's happening, not in all of the cities in Ukraine, but in many of them. And I think people are horrified by it. Um, and, uh, and the fact that it's happening in the heart of the continent of Europe, of all places, given our history uh, and the lessons we thought we'd learned, uh, is, makes it even more remarkable. Minister, are you hopeful for a diplomatic solution? Not in the short term. What I mean by that is that I think, unfortunately, we are, all the evidence would suggest that we're likely to, likely to see an escalation of military effort, if you want to call it that, but of the use of weapons and the, the brutal consequences of that in the, the days and weeks ahead. Uh, certainly, I think uh, all of us see the 9th of May as a sort of a, a very important moment in this conflict, because that is essentially uh, victory day for Russia uh, in the context of its history. Um, and so there is a sense that the Kremlin is trying to build a basis for um, positive messaging around the effort in Ukraine for its own people, because I don't think anyone else will believe it anyway, uh, by the 9th of May. So I think we will see an intensification of the um, the aggression uh, for the next few weeks. The real question is then what happens after that, whether there is a, a basis for pause uh, and a, a new effort at diplomatic solutions. I think all of us have to put a lot of effort into trying to increase the likelihood of that happening uh, in any way we can, because of course there's a real danger that the 9th of May will be used as a, as a means to escalate further. Um, the, um, the effort uh, on the Russian side. Um, so who knows? Um, I don't think anybody does, despite the extraordinary resources of this country in terms of its intelligence and its, its knowledge of what's happening in other parts of the world, including in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, I, I think we're all trying to figure out um, how, how this is, is likely to unfold. I mean, the one thing we know for sure is it's unfolded in a way that nobody expected mm. so far. So all of the military advice was that Ukraine couldn't last more than about four or five days when this invasion began, maybe a week or 10 days at the, at the outset. And here we are nearly nine weeks in, um, and um, uh, Ukraine and Ukrainians have shown this just incredibly inspiring courage and resolve and determination to protect themselves and their uh, and their country and their community and their families. Um, it's, it's, it's really, when you visit there, it's quite awe-inspiring. You know, you walk into the, to the foreign ministry and it's like walking through an obstacle course of sandbags to simply get in. Uh, you walk up the stairs in the, in the building and um, uh, there was a huge amount of furniture all piled up together in a net that had a release mechanism that was clearly designed if the, if the foreign ministry had been stormed by Russian troops, that they would release the furniture to try to slow their progress up, up the stairs. All of the, the fire hoses are connected, ready to go, expecting a missile strike. You know, this is the, this is the reality of, uh, of, of the, the center of Kyiv right now. Um, and of course, the reality of cities like Kershan and Mariupol uh, and Kharkiv and many other places where we still have yet to, to see the horrors of what has unfolded there. Uh, it's, 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 it's really extraordinary, but I think, um, I think the challenge for us is to not make decisions on the basis of emotion or anger. The challenge for leaders globally now is to make decisions on the basis of, uh, first of all, assisting in every way we can Ukraine to defend itself and trying to explore a basis for political dialogue and agreement. You know, in the, in the last round of face-to-face -face negotiations in Istanbul, there was more progress made there than many people realize, actually, in terms of a basis for uh, at least a temporary cessation of, of, um, of the war. Um, and uh, 
we need to get back there and not talk about military victories here um, uh, as if this will be solved. Like, undoubtedly, for now, the focus is on the battlefield. But, you know, this, um, I don't think peace will be delivered on the battlefield alone in this conflict. Uh, it's got to involve intelligent uh, and focused diplomacy uh, until we can bring it to an end. Current Minister, a number of questions have come in from the online viewers, but maybe we start with a question from the audience here. Um, does anyone have a question? There are microphones. Uh, if you don't mind coming up to the microphone, that'd be great. Thank you. Good morning, Minister. I was very lucky to spend a year in your constituency at UCC. And one of my professors, Johnny Murphy, whom I think you know, uh, used to try and convince his American students that Americans were fundamentally more conservative than the Irish. And in the past 10 years or so, we have seen a progressive trajectory in Ireland in terms of reproductive rights, in terms of gay rights, uh, in terms of sort of marginalization of, of, of church authority. How does a progressive Ireland inform your job in your position on the world stage? Gosh, good question. And it I, uh, um, allows me to talk about something outside of Northern Ireland and Ukraine. Um, um, the answer to that question is that it, it informs it a lot. So, you know, we ask ourselves the question all the time in the Irish Foreign Ministry, you know, what can we bring to international debates that can add value? You know, from an Irish perspective. You know, we're not a big military power, but we are very active when it comes to peacekeeping. Um, we're not a big political system, but we try to have a, uh, a say in, in global debates on lots of the big issues. Um, but to answer your question directly, um, you know, foreign policy for us is very much driven by gender equality, uh, by uh, sexual and, and reproductive rights now. Uh, and we both fund that and advocate for that uh, through the UN system primarily, but also within the EU. Um, and so we try to, to talk about the journey that Ireland has been on uh, in terms of um, how in Ireland the debates around divorce, abortion, uh, reproductive rights, uh, gender equality, marriage equality, uh, all of those things have evolved over time in Ireland, uh, and many other countries are at different stages of that journey. Um, and uh, and we, we try to use our own mistakes and our own successes as, in some ways, a case study to, uh, to encourage others to make a similar journey. Um, and I, I do that all the time when I'm in different countries from a foreign policy perspective. So I think um, if you're not leading by example, you're not very credible, you know, um, in truth. You know, if we're, if we're calling for change in other parts of the world, but we haven't managed to deliver it in our own home patch in Ireland, uh, then I think there's a, there's a pretty serious credibility problem. So, so the fact that much of the change that you refer to, which if you want to call it, uh, a, you know, a, a liberal, journey uh, or a liberal, liberalization journey that, that Ireland has been on, um, uh, I hope that that provides a pathway and, and an inspiration for other, for other countries to follow. Our relationship with the church has changed, but it's still very important uh, in many people's lives. Um, but I think the relationship between the church and state in Ireland now is more appropriate than it has been decades ago. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think it's important that we, uh, that we recognize the mistakes that Ireland has made as well as the successes because we've made many mistakes uh, in that space in the past. Um, and, um, but I think if you're honest about that and honest about the journey that you're on and the value system that, that drives that change, well, then you can be credible and hopefully influential. Uh, and this is, you know, for me, one of, one of your previous presidents talked in a number of speeches about the soft bigotry of low expectations, which is a quote that I often use when I'm talking to, to students uh, in schools and universities around this idea that some people grow up with a perceived label on their back, where even though people might be nice to them, 
they don't really expect them to achieve very much because of their skin color or because of the school they've gone to or because of the address that they come from or because of their family history or whatever. Uh, and I often think about that quote in the context of global politics too, around a sort of a soft bigotry of low expectations coming from small countries that don't really matter. And that actually it's the superpowers that decide everything. And I, found, I find that a sort of a motivation to, uh, to, to force the argument by strength of argument, as opposed to by military might or economic scale or uh, population size or whatever. And, um, and that's the beauty of the European Union, by the way. The European Union makes decisions by and large on the basis of the strength of argument. And there's no reason why Ireland can't be as influential as Germany on that argument, or France, or Spain, or Italy, countries that are multiples of our size. Um, and that is why, of course, the UN system for us is, is really the, the, you know, the centerpiece of our, of our foreign policy, because we believe if we can win the argument, we don't always succeed, um, but, but we can certainly try and influence things for the better. So, so in, in the areas that you talk about, um, and it's actually, a lot of it has happened in my political lifetime in the last two decades. Um, I think we have an interesting story to tell uh, that for other countries hopefully can be both inspiring and reassuring in terms of how you build a more tolerant, diverse society. You know, about close to 20% of the population living in, in Ireland today were not born in Ireland. Um, you know, a decade ago or two decades ago, that number would have been much, much smaller. Um, between now and 2040, we're planning to add a million people to the population of our country, and 50% of that million extra won't have been born on the island of Ireland. So we're planning for a more international, more multicultural, more diverse population, which of course is the story of this country, you know, and is, is a big part of its success. Um, and um, so that's, that's the journey we're on, and hopefully for other countries that are trying to forge a way forward, it can be a, it can be a case study that can, um, that can help in political decision making. Minister, a question came um, to us online that I think echoes the, the previous question. Um, the question asks, uh, what can countries uh, like Ireland, who are partners to the Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, do to encourage nuclear states not to use nuclear weapons as, as a first uh, strike weapon? God, yeah, look, absolutely. We, we, um, a lot of our work on the UN has been around um, trying to get more and more countries to sign up to, uh, to, to treaties that can reduce weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons. And uh, we talk and speak a lot about that. Um, I'm not sure how successful we've been, to be honest. Um, there hasn't been a nuclear weapon used for for quite some time. Um, I don't think we should be dismissive, though, of the, the possibilities in terms of what's happening at the moment and how that could spiral out of control in the months ahead. Uh, I don't think the use of a nuclear weapon is likely, but it's possible. And I think uh, that needs to be a sobering reminder for everybody uh, in terms of the work and efforts around uh, nuclear disarmament. Um, and of course, it'll take leadership from the, from the nuclear states to do that. Um, but we need to do everything we can to make sure that the group of nuclear states doesn't grow, uh, which is why, for example, Ireland plays a coordinating role in relation to the, uh, to the Iranian nuclear deal, or the JCPOA, as it's called, um, which uh, the United States is showing leadership on at the moment to try to put it back together. Um, and the EU is very supportive of, but Ireland is playing a coordinating role on the Security Council on. Um, and uh, I've been to Tehran twice in the last year um, uh, on those efforts. Um, so this is all about trying to ensure that there's not another country with a nuclear weapon or the capacity to develop one. And likewise, obviously, we take uh, uh, a close interest in, in what's happening in North Korea as well. Um, so, so yeah, we will continue to work in this space. Um, but. Um, in the context of some of the language and some of the threats that we've heard coming from Moscow in recent days and weeks. Uh, it's a sobering reminder of the, um, the awfulness of what's possible uh, if, we can't, um, if we can't manage the, the politics of this and if we can't prevent a, 
a conflict spiraling into something much bigger. Um, thank you, Minister. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time. Um, I want to take a moment just to thank the JFK Library for hosting us today. Um, Alan Price, Rachel Floor, Liz Murphy, and the team here at the JFK Library have been excellent in support of this. I want to thank the Irish government for its financial support of this, and the Consul General, Lisa Moore, the Vice Consul General, Shane Caffrey, and the team at the consulate here, your colleagues in Ivy House, uh, for their support. I want to thank you, Minister, for sitting and giving such fulsome answers um, in a very reflective way, I think. I've done a lot of these, and this, I think, was a very reflective uh, conversation, and I, I appreciate that. Finally, I hope the audience appreciated that reflective, uh, the reflective nature of this conversation, and I want to thank you and those who have tuned in online uh, for joining us this morning. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was great. That was really good. Thanks, thank you.